Being with your change log is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. We move fast and fix things here at ChangeLog because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. And we're hosted on Linode Cloud Servers. Head to Linode.com slash ChangeLog. This episode is brought to you by Linode, our cloud server of choice. It is so easy to get started with Linode. Servers start at just five bucks a month. We host ChangeLog on Linode cloud servers and we love it. We get great 24 seven support. Zeus like powers with native SSDs, a super fast 40 gigabit per second network and incredibly fast CPUs for processing. And we trust Linode because they keep it fast. They keep it simple. Check them out at linode.com slash changelog. Greetings, Gophers. Adam Stachowiak here, Editor-in-Chief of Changelog. We just did our first live show at London Gophers as part of GopherCon UK. Matt Ryer and Mark Bates were joined on stage by Liz Rice, Kat Zian, and Gautam Reggae to talk about the magic in Go standard library. Huge thanks to the organizers of London Gophers and GopherCon UK for making this possible. Let's get to it. Thank you. Hello. That was very generous of, of you giving that to just me. I really appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, Matt's going to edit that in over all his bad jokes later. <laughs> That's my text message message sound now. <laughs> yeah. from now on. Well, welcome to a very special episode of Go Time. And it's not just a podcast. This is also real life as well for those of us in this room. And it's a pre- pre-conference social for one of the best Go conferences in the world, go for con UK. So we've got that coming up. <laughs> this is also a part of the monthly meetup that is London Gophers, which we'll talk about a, a little bit more later as well, which is one of the best Go meetups in the world. So let's give it up for them. Yeah. If not the best in London. I think we can agree on that. And also, uh, the other voice you can hear is one of the best Mark Bates in the world. It's Mark Bates. That's right. That's me. Thank you, Matthew Ryer. I like to applaud myself because most people don't. Um, So thank you for having me. We're very excited. Uh, As you can tell, this is a very different go time than we normally do. Uh, We're in front of an audience, like Matt said. Matt's wearing trousers. Um, which that's, that's actually what I'm most nervous about. It's yeah. not having the live audience. So we'll see if that in you know, any way impacts uh, Matt's hosting abilities over the next uh, hour. They um, can't get worse. No, it really can't, honestly. Um, we've got such a wonderful panel um, of people uh, that we want to talk to. And so we're just going to obviously introduce them. I'm going to start with Liz. Uh, Liz Rice here. Uh, Liz, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so my name's Liz Rice. I run open source engineering at a company called Aqua Security, where we write lots of code in Go. So. Oh, round of applause. We can't do a round of applause on the podcast normally. This yeah, is brilliant. Right. Well, we can. It's yeah. just very weak. <laughs> Usually just Matt, again, he tells a joke and goes... Mm. No, no, no. To be fair, there are people on Slack clapping. Along yeah, with you. that is true. Yeah. Okay, then. That's true. Sometimes they miss all the fingers off on the emoji when they clap to me, though. Yeah, just the one. Weird. I've seen that, too. Yeah. I've... Really strange kind yeah, of way. I get that emoji a lot. It's weird. Yeah. It's one off, I think. I'm going to introduce another one of our panelists. I haven't made his name up. Genuinely, this is his real name. It's Gotham Reggae. Just imagine. <laughs> Gotham, now, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, well, if you want to push it to the limits, you know, I'm on Go Time. My name is... Gautam. Oh, Gautam. It's pretty close by. Very good. And that's why they decided to get me on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> what we really like doing is giving Matt, we tell him one pronunciation of somebody's name, Schlesinger, <laughs> Borsico, <laughs> Gotham. And we just like to see what he does with it on stage. It's quite fun. Yeah. I, I'm much better in text. <laughs> <laughs> Now. So Gotham, tell us about yourself. So, well, I have my own uh, software company back home in India. It's called Josh Software, and uh, Josh in my mother tongue means, means enthusiasm and passion. So Great. Uh, that's what we do. We do a lot of uh, consulting in Go and Ruby, and these are the only two languages we've been doing for the last 12 years. 
So you don't me. happen to also maybe run a Go conference in India, do you? Yeah, actually, I'm the organizer for GoForCon India. Thank oh, there you, you go Mark. then. So if you want to go to India. And uh, just to let you all know, the next time it's in, it's in Goa, which is a residential conference. That means uh, all the attendees and speakers, all we book the entire hotel. Wow. And everybody stays together. So if anyone's interested in coming to Goa, which is like the, you know, it's like the Florida of India. <laughs> so it's, it's hotter than the rest of India. The, the problem is a lot of people register for the conference but don't attend the conference because they're on the beach. <laughs> it's, it's like really on brand place name though, Goa. Absolutely. Yeah. Go right. in Goa. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Couldn't have it in a place called Java. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's an actual place called Java that you yeah. could have just actually used. <laughs> I'm much better in text. <laughs> yeah, Again, that's that single finger emoji. Uh, and in the middle here, we have Kat. Kat, say hi. Hello, um, I'm Kat. Um, I work for Monzo, who's a, which is a company here in London. And I also am one of the co-organizers of London Gophers, together with Dom and Paul and Antonio. We're all wearing yellow t-shirts tonight, so if you want to chat to us, by all means come along. Uh, come up to us and, and say hello. Um, so a big thanks to GopherCon UK and GoTime for doing this together. This is awesome. And uh, as always, thanks to our sponsors, Monzo Bud and Mas Martin from Vistas, uh, without whom we wouldn't be able to run our meetup. It's a monthly meetup here in London, so if you're local and you haven't been to one of the meetups yet, or if you're passing by, uh, by all means sign up on the meetup page. We are organizing meetups every third Wednesday of the month in central London. Fantastic. Do you have a Twitter account that perhaps people can follow? We do. Surprisingly, at London Gophers. Wow. <laughs> Who would have thought? And Kat, I noticed you didn't say your last name. Is that because you don't know how to read it properly? Like yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> it's another one of those names we give Matt. It's Kat Jing. Jing. Easy. Gets better every time. There you go, yeah. <laughs> uh, in, in addition to the London Gophers uh, and all their great support and the, the support we get, they get from uh, their routine uh, recurring sponsors, we also want to thank JFrog. Um, not for the people at home, they, don't, they honestly don't know what's going on. Um, but for you in the audience, uh, those nice tasty beverages you got when you walked in the door, that was courtesy of JFrog. They, they sponsored uh, the welcome drinks tonight. Uh, they have a little booth in the back where they're giving away lots of free stuff. Um, so big round for them for yeah. hitting the bill for tonight. Thank you. And now, legally speaking, that's all the stuff that we have to say is now said. So now, we really are on our own. And this is normally that when we do the podcast, we, uh, the idea is we do the live show and it's kind of relaxed and we're not sort of too serious about it. And then hopefully they can find good bits to make <laughs> into a podcast at some point. Uh, so that's what we'll do this time. So if it seems bad, it's, it's not. That's just It's lie. an illusion. <laughs> yeah. I forgot to mention one thing. Go on. We have this gopher plushie here, and this is a prize for the best question for tonight. So we're going to have some uh, audience questions. We're yes. going to take some questions from the audience at the end, and the best question is going to win the gopher plushie. And Matt does have a random gift he's been desperate to give away for I some bizarre reason. I have a gophercon towel from the wrong gophercon. A beach gopher towel. <laughs> from, uh, yeah, the wrong gophercon. Yeah. It's from, the diff it's from the other gopher con, but it's still a towel. <laughs> and if you like being dry. Is so it unused? It's unused, yeah. 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 I hope. To be clear. Be dry. It is a soiled beach towel. Um, <laughs> so for all you British gophers out there, you love going to the beach. Uh, so next time you're sitting on an umbrella in the rain, uh, eating an ice lolly in a sweater, you'd have a lovely gopher towel underneath you. That's um, why it's soiled, because we sit on soil. <laughs> <laughs> So this is what happens when we go off script. Oh, yeah. See, look, now you're just moaning at us. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine. Moaning is acceptable because at least you can hear it on the podcast and it, 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 it backs up that we're here in real life. <laughs> and otherwise, I do think people are going to question that. Fair enough. I think we should start. I think we should start yeah. too. Today, we decided we're going to start by talking about the sparkle emoji in the standard library. Uh, again, I am better in text. But it's the sparkle, it's the gold in the standard library, or the magic in the standard library. The bits. I, I, I actually pinged Gotham and I said, we're going to be talking about the gems of the standard library. And he goes, the hidden well, gems. this is the wrong conference. We're supposed to be talking about, that's Ruby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's like, yeah, so we're, we're, we're really, really on point with the name of this. Absolutely, because none of us know what it is. Yeah, it's, it's the, the bits of the standard library that each of us have kind of fallen somewhat in love with to varying degrees. I've oh. fallen in, in, in with mine a lot. Uh, in love, uh, but others maybe not, not so much. <laughs> so, well, 
exactly. Just a quick example of something that would hopefully get cut out of the podcast, <laughs> <laughs> so no one even knows about it. But uh, the editors are, uh, oh, I wouldn't yeah. say lazy, but they, they, they leave it all in, basically. Well, let's, let's start, I think we should start right here in the middle with Kat. Kat, can you give us a little nugget of gold, a little something that maybe the audience here may or may not know about in the standard library that you just love and kind of think, oh, wow, I wish more people knew about this. So I hope everyone knows about it. If not, they should definitely look it up. And that, my favorite one is context. I think I, I just find this the most, surprisingly, the most usable day-to-day -day, uh, package hmm. for me because it just solves a problem that I've always had. Like my background is in PHP, so that's a, a lot of web applications, a lot of requests and responses. And I always struggled with like, how much data do you pass along and where do I pass along this data, and I ended up having like method function names with 14 parameters in, because you needed to pass in all the data. And then I, when I started doing Go and I discovered context, I'm like, this is a solution to that problem, and it's very elegant, and that's only one side of the package. It's a really like weirdly split brain package, because on one side you've got the, the params that you can pass in in the context, and then on the other hand you've got the whole, uh, like, Go routine management side of things. So with context, the cancellation and, and timeouts and deadlines. And I, fe I find that this is a, just a great tool to manage your channels, your Go routines and everything. Um, and it's very elegant. It's very simple. It's an interface with like three methods or something. So four, I think, four, yeah. 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 Um, because yeah, it, the request params is the fourth one. So yeah, I, I love it. And I use it pretty much daily. Could you give so. us a f an example where you've abused it? You've done I've, something I've been, you probably shouldn't have with context? No, so I've been very good at like, making sure that the, I think the only rule with the params side of things is just pass in params that don't change throughout the lifecycle of the request. So I didn't cheat, I didn't put my database connection in there <laughs> or <laughs> something. So I've, I've always avoided this. I've been a good citizen. Um, and then I remember like, reading a bunch of books which all used context for examples of uh, deadlines and cancellations and timeouts in a really clever way. Um, so I've tried to do that. I can't, I can't say I do this a lot day to day because it's like most of the time when you use libraries, it's all taken care of for you. Mm -hmm. But under the hood, it still uses the context. And then when my request times out, I see in the logs like you know context timeout. Exceeded, so yeah. yeah, so I'm like yeah context. <laughs> so for anybody that doesn't know why that got a laugh when you said you don't put the database connection in there, maybe we should talk a bit about that because when you yeah. do use the values inside a context, yeah, which is the, the context with value, right? Yeah, yeah. context with value. Yeah. They're sort of hidden dependencies. Yeah. They can be, can't they? So yeah, sideline yeah. APIs. Uh, often Ooh. referred to yeah, as. The, yeah, the, the problem, like the main gotcha with this is that at no point in the, in the life cycle of your like, thread, uh, you don't know what's inside the context and you don't have a list of the values that you can access, so you have to know that they are there. So the kind of gotcha with this is like only use values that throughout the whole life cycle you can expect that value to be there and also not mission critical values. So if it's not there, it's not the end of the world. So a very com common use case is log, par uh, log parameters. So if you want to log something and you want to add a bunch of metadata to your log lines, then you can store them in the context, but if they're not there, it's on the end of the world because they just won't get logged. Like the app still runs, it's fine. Whereas if you rely on your database connection being there, and by the way, like context values are not guarded in any way against being overridden or changed halfway through, you basically have no guarantees that what you put in at the beginning is the same at the end. So, um, yeah, my, yeah. I, I always say uh, they should be like user request specific. Yeah. Like you know things that you would get necessarily like if someone made an HTTP request, you so like a session ID or user ID like. Things that are kind of very specific yeah. to that. that Small, request. specific, yeah. and constant, and not mission critical. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think most, most yeah. microservices are now just uh, coming up with a paradigm where you must have the context passed around everywhere, interfaced properly, and a context. And if that happens, you actually have a lot of control over what's happening. So mm. definitely helps. Yeah. I like the fact that the done method returns a channel which gets yeah. closed when the context is canceled. So then if you do have concurrent code and you use the select block, it's very easy for one of the cases to just be the done off the context, and you can do other things, and it'll keep doing those other things until that context gets canceled, and then you can gracefully shut down. It's actually a really easy way to do graceful shutdowns. Yeah, one of my favorite parts is the fact that, um, so if you're unfamiliar with it, the way you, you create context, you're actually continually wrapping them. Um, so you're always kind of creating this node of context, which means you can start with, say, the user request. So on HTTP request, there is a context. Um, so if the user 
shuts their browser, for example, uh, that context gets canceled. And you can use that as like your primary context, let's say in a web app, and then spawn that off to other things and they can wrap that with their own timeouts, their own cancellations, their own values, and it all kind of trickles down or just this little bit cancels itself. Yeah. And I think it's a really yeah. clever pattern they used yeah. uh, to do that, the, the kind of node. Yeah, I think the cool thing as well is like the context package in itself. Like I'm a bit hazy on like the implementation details, but I know that it can uh, like flatten itself or like unpack itself. So like if you have a bunch of nested context, you can, you call this like context something something that you can just like unpack like flatten the context to context to the most recent values. Okay, that's I've new. Seen, when are, what I've is seen, that? I've seen yeah. that, and I, that's why I said I'm a bit hazy on details. But there is a way to like. <laughs> If you have a bunch of nested context, and like if you call that met that, that uh, function, it will like bring up the sort of the compound context with all the ones like the ones that were nested just flattened to oh, the top. Interesting. I need to dig up the name. Yeah, I'm curious. Send it yeah. to me, um, or post it on Twitter so everybody else sees it. Don't yeah. just send it to me privately. We'll do it now. Show notes later. Uh, I want to get smarter than you, so don't don't send it to them. Um, so you don't know the con uh, so you don't know the internals. Um, if you've never seen it, Frances Campoy uh, actually did two videos for. Um, just for funk about context when it first came out. And one of them I think is just truly wonderful where he basically rebuilds almost the entire package from scratch. Uh, and it, it's really clever and I highly recommend you watch it because it shows a great use of go routines and channels and, and kind of keeping all this stuff in play and how these context cancellations and stuff work. Uh, it's an excellent, excellent video. Mm -hmm. Brilliant choice, Kat. Yeah. And would you say you just like the context package? You love it? or you're in love with it. I love it because it makes my life so much easier. Right. Like I, I, I find it just the, the most useful day to day because like, so at work we actually have a, a thing where like our request struct, like an internal request thing, it implements, it sort of inherits the context interface so you can pass interchangeably the context, context or the request and that just makes, like, makes life so much easier uh, that I just love it because if I, like our logging library requires the context for all the extra params, but I can just pass in the request and like I don't need to do any marshalling in between or anything. Oh, so they've implemented the context interface itself. Yeah. Yeah, so then you can provide your own context <laughs> objects like right. that, can't you? Yeah. And Buffalo does this too. Yeah, Buffalo it? does that. We do it in a lot of projects as well. Yeah, and it's, it's a pattern I recommend people actually use. Yeah. And a lot of times you just kind of embed a context.context. .context. Um, which yeah. is obviously not very good for the whole don't stutter and go thing. <laughs> Everything yeah. is just context, not context yeah. everywhere. But you can kind of take in the context that someone gives you and then build your own and do different things with it. Maybe provide your own value implementation, which is what yeah. Buffalo does. It kind of has a map of your request parameters and stuff yeah. like that. You can also do it the other way around. So like if, you, if your struct implements the context interface, like your code that then deal, can deal with either the native context or the, or the struct and then check like, oh, if it's this struct, so for us, for example, it's, it's a case of um, like our requests have a context, but then our um, logging library checks that if the, the, the thing passed in is actually an instance of that request, not just a pure context, then you know that the request struct also has a bunch of more details that you can fish in and put in the logging library. So you can kind of do it the other way around as well. Um, but yeah, it's, like, it's seamless and it's so great. And I, do it, like, I use it every day. Every time you implement a handler, you encounter the context. So. So, yeah. so interestingly also, uh, we are always talking in the context of a web request. But uh, I mean, I have seen a couple of cases where people have misused or wrongly used the context. <laughs> just Go, because, it's, example, just because yeah. it's cool. In a command or something, you mean? Yeah. I mean, uh, and I'm then you end up people. doing context <laughs> to do. <laughs> like, yeah, well, so just put I've up a dummy it. context and move ahead. I use it in a command. So I'll have the main function will trap the signal and I'll cancel a context, which I then pass into just some other yeah. run function. And uh, Dave Cheney told me off on Twitter for doing this. <laughs> right. That's Dave. But that's Dave. Yeah. yeah. But because uh, he said it's for it's for requests only. But in a command, in a way, I think that is, is a request. The request. Yeah. yeah. It's a user what do you mean running the CLI. Like you mean somebody at a CLI typing in a command? Yeah. yeah. So because so that could. That's a request. That's a request. So yeah. I'm asking you to I would do, do that. I often yeah. pass context in as well, where, a, the first value yeah. to a new, for example. Where depending were you when Dave was having a go at me on Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> too, too little, too late. Yeah. <laughs> no, but here's the who, thing. Who trusts what Dave Cheney says, really? <laughs> so <laughs> that's an example of something that might actually get cut out. <laughs> it's quite exciting when you, when you hear them. You Everybody think, right yeah. now is tweeting at Dave. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I just said, what is my, yeah, who's, who's Dave, really? <laughs> but the thing about about the uh, command and using requests and contexts in that sense is if you're doing some long process, 
if you trap the signal, then that's command C will cancel that context and you can just unwind everything. Yeah. It's a properly nice way to do that graceful shutdown. So it fits perfectly. I, I agree. Yeah. I think that's nice. So yeah. you, need to, you need to be able to use it. I've seen cases where uh, we're using MongoDB and there's a lot of context being used and I've seen code where people have like, dude, I don't know why it's there. <laughs> so I just put a dummy context and make it happen and that comes and bites you later on. Yeah. Because uh, suddenly your context is changed from a request. So when people yeah. are building bottom up, so you build your code first and then you have an API added to it and that context is misused, you just have context or two there. Yeah. And the HTTP request which finally comes through is not using the context there and it's failing and uh, you do not realize it until all your test, ca your test cases bypass it. And you, you realize it in production. And that hurts. So you have to be a little careful. I never got that to do. I, I actually yeah, don't get the, that. The, what's the, well, the difference, context to so do. context not to do, it differs from <laughs> context not background in that they're the exact same thing, but the idea is you can grab for to do in your code. Yeah. yeah, yeah if, you don't, if you don't know what to do, you can't, well, let's just always do that. <laughs> right. Let's just, let's if you just write don't know what to do, if you don't know what yeah, to do, so. just to do. If you just can take anything to do. Anyway, cancel. So, so I have a, I have actually a question oh, for the I panel. I just canceled the content. Yeah, you did. Uh, good job. Um, we're almost at our timeline, by the way. We're almost exceeding <laughs> yeah. that. Uh, I so I, I actually it. have a question for the panel. So when they introduced contexts into the standard library in one seven, right? Um, obviously they tried to retrofit it wherever they could, um, and because of that, we now have like this exec exec with context or like, you know, command, you know, exec dot command, exec dot command context, right? Yeah. Where we now have two versions of every API or a lot of APIs, a SQL package has Cassandra, a very similar yeah. thing, right? Um, wh what do people feel like? I mean, do you feel like you should also offer two implementations, one that has a context and one that doesn't? Do you think we should only just take the context and... The only reason there's two is because context came after and, the, and they have the that's, version that's 1.7. That's almost what I just said when I said they retrofitted in 1.7. <laughs> and they have a backwards... It's almost the same thing. I mean, not quite. You say it a lot nice with the accent. Exactly. Yeah. I'm, I'm, giving, I'm giving people a treat. <laughs> you really are. It's not a treat here. We're in London. Everyone talks like me. They, they know I'm shit. <laughs> that's going to get cut out, I think. <laughs> <laughs> But let me ask the question on the panel. I mean, it's, a, it's the compatibility promise, isn't it? Right. You can't introduce something like that and just, you know, it, context is useful. I think we just established that. So, what so, other options? So, okay, do you so let me have? rephrase the question and go to the infamous go to mm. comes out alongside TextMate 2, Perl 6, uh, <laughs> and all the other ones. Um, <laughs> so, when go to finally comes out and we're all out of the game because we've retired for 20 years. Um, should they remove the non-context versions? I think I wouldn't necessarily say like remove. I mean, in two, yes, because you, you're not bound to with the backwards com compatibility promise. And I feel like because context pro context provides an easy way to just put in a dummy context if you don't need it, even if every function requires it, there's just an easy way for you to not use it if you don't want to. I feel like if there was no context background or context to do, it would be kind of unfair to always force people to have the context. But because you have an easy way out. I don't see a problem with just forcing it for every function. Like it's kind of become a standard anyway, where the first param is always context right. anyway. So which has led to so many fun proposals on GoLang <laughs> issues, right? Of yeah. Should we? Do we have some sort of current context that we can just grab? We don't have to keep passing it around. Yeah. Um, I don't think we have time for that discussion. <laughs> I, would, I wouldn't mind a copy co context. I O copy with a context. Oh so yeah, that'd be quite that. nice. Like just yeah. yeah. If someone did write one, there is one that you can use. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay, cool. I think uh, we should move on. Uh, yeah, I'd love to hear obviously some other ones. Yeah. Gotham. Tell us a little bit about your favorite parts of the standard library. So when I started writing, uh, you know, what is the interesting part? I realized that, uh, you know, it, it's everything's about the name. So my favorite package, uh, luckily or unluckily, is the the regxp. Not because it's my surname. My surname is R E G E, and it's there <laughs> in the package name. But I actually genuinely like regular expressions, and I think it is uh, one of the most important things to learn. Not in particularly in Go. But in general, so I always say that if you know regular expressions, your Linux command and Vim, you're a programmer. <laughs> all right, so all the Emacs haters out there, too bad. <laughs> Other IDEs but, are available. I should just say that. Yeah, we don't discriminate against IDEs, <laughs> yeah. except but, for TextMate. Too, yeah, so so uh, which recently. hasn't come out yet. So you're good. <laughs> recently, good recently I looked at the regxp slash syntax package. 
Mm. And that's pretty neat because it? it's it's got a lot of information about the various nuances of using regular expressions, including your named captures and your greedy searches in the right context with the Perl based as well as the ASCII based uh, syntaxes. And uh, I think it's a must read for everyone, if not to use it, and stop using Stack Overflow or Google to find out what is the fastest way to find a regular expression, copy paste, and put it in. Because <laughs> it causes problems later on. Especially Parker. if you copy and paste from the top, because that's the question. <laughs> <laughs> I make that mistake all the time. Oh, man. And I just got this on Dude, Stack Overflow. Yeah, from the question. <laughs> that's None taking, of it works. That, that's taking laziness to the next level. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, the syntax it's, it's, package is amazing because it really does show everything. Yeah. Um, you know, there's more to it, obviously, um, and there's a lot of stuff. There's actual code that happens in the syntax package too, but the yeah. documentation at it's the top fantastic. is fantastic and worth it alone, and I often refer to it, like and, daily. And a lot of times uh, <laughs> we don't end up using the captures, which is, uh, it's been there since the regular expressions ever evolved. But uh, we tend to miss out and write a lot of more code trying to you just use substring and parse and figure it out where uh, captures would actually just give you the, you know, the array back. So Can you give us an example where that's really helped you in your code, like apart from just simple regular expressions, like, you know, I don't know. Uh, let me think about it. But uh, there have been cases. About it. Yeah, we got yeah, time. Um, <laughs> we'll wait. They're yeah, editing so, this later. Take your time. Yeah. Fine. So there, there was a case where we were trying to uh, map out the entire URI. You know, like with the username at the rate, password, colon, host, mm. port, everything together. So you wanted to write your own URI.parse. Yeah, uh, it turned out to be a nightmare because, because somebody just tried to go the distance saying, oh, the host could actually have uh, a.b.c.d, and they started doing, using a substring. Right. And iterating over that. And then I saw the code, the code had already become like 100 lines of code, and I'm like, dude, you've not heard of captures? <laughs> you just <laughs> capture it and just match it. And it just, it's just easy sometimes to look at the uh, documentation first and implement it. But it's a common mistake. So, so when you say captures, for those who maybe not know the regex package, because that's kind of what we're here for, what do you mean by the, captures? Just the, the parentheses? The, 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 yeah. You were trying to match a group of parentheses with or without greedy searches. So you want to actually find out if, say for example, if you want to match just a subdomain. But a subdomain could actually go really like, if you look at your, uh, the canonical name for an AWS host, it's huge but it has everything in it, and you want to find out the, just the host name, not the rest of it. You can always capture it without greedy searches, or you can find out if it is the, matching the right pattern using captures, the parenthesis, in your regular expression just to check. Well, there are ways that you can even replace stuff in it, but not recommended for readability purposes. But if you're just getting through the, the regexp syntax package, there's a lot of clarity which comes out. You can even name a captured field. Mm. It'll get you back in a, in a hash with a named hash, so you can actually process it better. Mm. That's yeah. pretty cool. That is cool. Yeah. My problem with regex is it's too easy. Yeah, like that's a, everybody's problem. I like a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> that's like, what? OK. Stack oh, that's clearly human readable. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, like, let's make it a bit more difficult. Yeah. But yeah, once you learn it, though, of course. Yep. Yeah. So it's, it's fun because then, then you, you're not just coding to finish a job, but you're actually doing it well. Yeah. yeah. You're casting then, spells as well at the same time. And I'm not going to lie to you, it feels amazing when you get a regex that works. <laughs> yep. yeah. Like truly amazing, yeah. doesn't Absolutely. it? You're I like, know. I won the internet today. <laughs> I got the regex to compile and do what like, I wanted it to do. I love those um, like regex 101 where you can go and like live. <laughs> Test your regex. Oh, yeah, but it's just yeah. hours of fun. It's like online, online, out how to break online somebody else's generator. <laughs> or rubular.com, which is uh, for So there's actually gobular. Yes. Dot com, yeah. uh, which does go reg regular expressions. Yeah. Uh, whoever wrote it, though, was an amazing developer, and they wrote it in Buffalo. Uh -huh. uh, yes. And they're just, they're really <laughs> handsome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the interesting part about Rubular and Gobular. That would be me. Oh. Like just, just to clarify, not Matt, because that's yeah. who, Matt's like, I don't remember writing that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did, but yeah, it's Rubular for Go. Yeah. So how did you check your side? Because I always wonder, it's like a chicken and egg with those like, online, online regex checkers for like, well, if we check our regex with them, what, who do they check with? Kind of thing. Yeah. We, we compile it and we use the regex, <laughs> yeah. pa use yeah, the regex but like, package but and give I, you the result. But if you think about it, like if there's a bug on that website, then like everybody else's regex is wrong and like they obviously can't find their own bugs. No, because yeah. you just give me a string of regex, I run it through compile, 
and it either True. compiles or not. Yeah. I, it's not like I'm sitting there parsing. Like, I don't have a big regex that parses regex. <laughs> <laughs> like, you think that's what I'm doing yeah. like, on my weekends. <laughs> I, <laughs> we come right, back to the regex package. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, but there's still like, a chicken and egg, because then like, if you just run it through compile, then what checks compile? Well, the Go team. Who <laughs> 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 checks the Go team? Anyway, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Dead end. Right. <laughs> Didn't need this. No, but it's a good Microphone. point that Kat brings up. Who watches the regex watch people? Um, <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll, we may never know. Yeah. Funny, like, there, 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 I've run into a few cases with regex where like, something works in one language and doesn't yeah. work in the other language, and that always puzzles me. Yeah. 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 It's like your last name. <laughs> that just doesn't compile anywhere. It just doesn't compile to me, in my brain. Not when, the, when I see it written down. I uh, believe does, the Go does uh, implement Perl style regex, correct? Yeah. I think so, yeah. 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 Not the PHP one, because that never worked. Yeah, it, it definitely Across, does, yeah. doesn't match Ruby's either. Yeah. There are a few places where Ruby right. doesn't Interesting, match. Interesting, yeah. which is why I think everyone should actually look at that package documentation because you know there is one way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> That's the only way you can't want to look at it. Can't argue with that. Yeah, yeah. It'll, it'll, and often if you read the documentation, you'll see cool things like at the top, like you can do colon alpha colon, so the right? And that's, like, that's all of the alpha characters. Like you don't have to specify them. You can do colon digits and like all these kind yeah. of nice combinations of that very readable words as opposed to slash D or slash capital D and right. slash Question whatever. Question for you. Does colon alpha cover all the kind of accented characters and like non-Roman so characters? So alpha is only for ASCII. Just ASCII. Just ASCII. Okay. So that's the only ASCII way. So that's the problem with white characters. So if you're doing white characters, regular expressions is another beast. So, so what about uh, UTF-8? Right? I mean, Go, is, you know, Go has UTF-8 support built in. If you range over hello world you know, Chinese characters, you're going to get you know, the nice spaces and the indexes are going to jump appropriately and you get a full character. Unlike other languages, you get a third of a character. <laughs> right? How does that actually work with regex? I mean, are, are you able to regex over I think white UTF-8 character characters? support is there for uh, regular expression support already. Okay. And I don't think it gets to UTF-8 because then you need to actually, suppose you're looking at uh, maybe some Japanese or Chinese character, one kanji, mm -hmm. you, cannot, you, have the, you cannot compare it with the UTF-8. So you'll have to have, to have the regular expression support wide characters for, for it. I haven't tried it because I have not got down to typing out one of the kanji's stuff in a regular <laughs> expression. It'd right. be fun, but, yeah. but it, it, should work. it should support it. There you go. Fantastic. Great. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. One Sometimes of my on very the first professional jobs was doing double byte character support in a 3270 emulator, if I remember rightly. It was horrible. Now she can write the 3270 <laughs> emulator in 20 minutes on stage <laughs> for fun. She cracks her knuckles and goes, hang on. Just get my computer out. Yeah, exactly. She'll do it for us by the end of the podcast. <laughs> But Liz, you were mentioning earlier about IO reader and IO writer. Yeah, yeah. Something. So when we were first discussing doing this, uh, this podcast and the, this topic of you know, the gold in the standard library, one of the things that strikes me, if you think about the whole of it, is how prevalent really nice interfaces like IO reader and IO writer are, which mean you can easily kind of plug and play with different, you know, Things Whatever. that you want to input or output. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and also the richness of the things that you can plug into that interface. So, you know, you want to write out some JSON, that's, that's there for you. You want to write out to a file, that's there for you. You want to write out to, you know. They're brilliant, I'm simple interfaces, aren't they? They're just thing. so, they're so simple, simple and brilliant. And they're so pluggable and so testable, which is. Great. Yeah, yeah my, so. my, my favorite part of the IO written writer is the design they've used for the interfacing. It's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. it's just something that you should actually look at, get into the details of how it's designed, and try to implement something like that in your work. It really helps. And so the number of times smooth. where we have, you know, somebody says, oh, it would be really nice if you could output this report in a different format. And go, well, OK, fine. Yeah. Give me a different writer, right? Yeah. I'm going to yeah. gzip it, boom, still yeah. just a writer. The bytes buffer, just a writer file, yeah. just a writer. And what I love about them is the symmetry of the, the read write interface. They're identical. True. It's yep. just read and write. Like, and it's just beautiful symmetry between the two, mm. right? They're identical looking interfaces. And just so, it's very beautiful. Yeah. It's just very clean, mm. isn't it? And I think yeah. it'd be hard pushed to find another language that has that kind of breadth of similarity between 
what the interfaces that you get from different packages. I think it's I a think beautiful the, thing. The real magic as well, I think, is the, the fact that they're single method interfaces. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So an interface with one method is so easy to implement, right? It gets implemented a lot. And this one, that's a good example of it. Um, it's very exciting when you're doing your own projects, when you, I feel like it's a discovery, like you discover a single method interface. And then you can do things like the trick of using other types as the base and then implementing that interface. Like, you, like Handle Funk does it for Handle. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, I actually showed that in my workshop today. That's one of my favorites. Um, just mm -hmm. the way you know, Go type systems work, where you can say type handler funk is a funk that takes a response writer and a pointer to request. And then on that, you can implement another method <laughs> that calls itself and implements the HTTP handler interface. Yes. Like, so then when you need to use that type, you don't need to implement that. You don't need to build a struct and implement that type. You can just use a function. Yeah. So that it gets used even more. But I, I agree. Reader and writer, and there are they are quite strange, I think, when you first come to Go, seeing a read method that takes in a slice of bytes and just returns an int or an error right. is a strange thing. But yeah. it, it it kind of really reflects what's really happening under the hood. Absolutely. So it has well, that mechanical sympathy. I, I think it's for me it was more just like this can't possibly be it. Like that was my take. Like when I first mm. came to it, I'm like, it's just one method. How is that writing? Like, isn't there other stuff I need to do when I'm writing stuff or reading yeah, stuff? Yeah. Uh, and yeah, there is. And there are other interfaces, yeah. <laughs> right? Maybe you want to close it, and that's there's a closer interface. Like those are just amazing interfaces. Yeah, yeah. I can see why you like them. I do. Yeah, yeah. we should all. Yeah, I do. and there's so much about the standard library that gives you just so much power out of the box. So. I, the other thing that kind of struck me when we first talked about doing this podcast was, well, HTTP, net HTTP, everything you need to write a website right there in, you know. Buffalo users, don't listen code. to her. She <laughs> doesn't know what she's talking about. You need Buffalo. But the fact that you can get a web server running in, and I think you made the point, Kat, about one you line, know, one line yeah. of code, it's amazing. And again, point to another language where that's possible. Yeah. It's out of the standard library. It's yeah. really nice. Yeah. Well, I think what, what I love about that is, um, you know, most standard libraries have web, right, packages. And they have, like, Ruby, for example, um, you know, has the ability to, a built-in web server called WebBrick, which kind of gives you an idea of how good a server it is. It's called WebBrick. <laughs> <laughs> Right? Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, but you know, you wouldn't use it out of the standard library, you use Rails because it's not useful. It's not designed well. And those packages in the Ruby standard library just aren't able to do what people needed to do. And that's how things like Rails came up. With with Go, I mean admittedly, obviously as a you know, maintainer of Buffalo, I've got different end goals which are more development, you know, user development and stuff like that. But to just to sit there and say, listen.serve, here's a function and serve yeah. this function. I think the first time it's I saw amazing. it, however many years ago when I first saw that, and I was looking at it thinking, how can that possibly be it? <laughs> A bit like what you're saying about IO Reader. You know, how, how does surely, that work? <laughs> surely there must be more to it. And then you realize, well, actually, no, there's a ton yeah. of defaults that it can take care of. And if, yeah, and if you want to mess with those defaults, you can, but you don't have to. And Ta-da, website in mm. one line of code is well, nice. What I love, too, is you can actually turn that then into an SSL site with two lines of code, <laughs> right? You yeah. can take the same muxer that you just used, the same handler, and just do go, listen, and serve on another port. <laughs> yeah. And now you've got port 80 and you've got port 443 running simultaneously because you just launched the same muxer in a different go routine on a different port yeah. in two lines of code, which yeah. is really, really cool, mm. right? You don't have to really stretch to get there, do you? Yeah, and I like that it's, it's pretty safe to use for beginners as well because things like, like request timeouts or connection timeouts, it's not something that you care about when you first start programming. Whereas this one, you just do one line of code and you're excited because you've got a web server running and then if you want to dig in, you kind of have... I really liked the nice... One of the, my favorite things about Go is like if you go into the, the, the source code, they have really nice com comments that then become the, dot, the um, Go doc uh, source. And it just really explains what everything is, like the connection timeouts and request timeouts. And you can kind of dig in a bit more and learn a bit more about how HTTP works under the hood. But you don't have to care if you're a beginner. So it's like a very low barrier to entry. And I remember this struck me a lot when um, 
So there is a book called uh, The Philosophy of Software Design by, I think it's John Osterhout, and I've probably butchered the name. But he talks about deep modules and shallow model modules, and he gives that exact example. So in Go, you've got, like, um, say, with the, IO, with the reader and writer, you've got an inter interface with one method, and it's kind of a deep module because, as a user, you, it's just a black box that you call. You don't care what it does under the hood. You don't need to know in order to use it. And if you want to, you can dig in a bit more. Uh, and he, he compares it to Java, where in order to, do a, a, in, in, in order to read a file, you need a reader, and then you need a buffered reader, and you need a string buffered reader, and you have to know how this works in order to use it, and that's the difference. So that's why I like Go, because HTTP is another example of, like, you can just call it out of the box and treat it like a black box, or you can dig in, but you don't need to. I feel like that's the genius of the design of those packages. I think the standard library really does it very well. So, you know, um, I've had lots of conversations with the Go team. And I remember I was having one with Steve Francia, who's one of the program managers for the Go team. Um, and you know, we were talking about just this, and he said, you know, we, the standard library is designed to be building blocks, right? You can start there and then layer on top of that more abstractions if you need them and other stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, like the SQL package, if you ever use a SQL package, it's very raw. Right? And it feels quite clunky and cumbersome. And the reason is because that's the building blocks for building more abstractions on top if you want to, right? And the same thing with the HTTP package, right? There are times where I'm like, oh, it doesn't do error handling. Like, I wish it returned an error, <laughs> you know? Um, but that's fine. You can then build an abstraction. I actually just did this a little error check thing that takes a handler, returns a handler. Uh, or returns my own type of handle and returns an error, and I can do the error handling now in one place, right? But it's a little abstraction I just build on top of it. And the standard library lets you do that because it's so easy to work with in that yeah. way. Hmm. All right? yeah. And that's how everybody has their own HTTP router now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think that, that's kind of a nice segue to the other package that I think Gotham mentioned, which was the HTTP util reverse, single reverse proxy, yeah. which is another thing on top of HTTP. That is very elegant. So tell us yeah, about so that. What's the single reverse So this was, proxy? this was something that, uh, that came along. It was not something that I was searching for. But uh, if you ever get a chance, have a look at HTTP util uh, single host reverse proxy method. So basically, if you want to modify the response that is going out on your HTTP server, you can intercept any kind of these responses and make whatever changes you want. So because you have a reverse proxy there, you can uh, basically tag it along with a particular URL. And uh, so think about this. How often can you, how easy or difficult is it for you to intercept a redirect request from a server? So by default, we just think it's a, it's a browser thing, but it's a server who's sending back a 302. Can I intercept that 302 request and maybe make a change in the, the token, the JOT token, or maybe change in the, the URL that is getting sent back? We can do that. So if you use a single host reverse proxy method in that, it uh, helps you modify the response. There's a method called modify response, where you can actually take back the status code, modify the response, and send it back seamlessly. It's, uh, you'll probably do it when you're in <laughs> aqua security. I'm pretty sure you'll probably do that. <laughs> if, yeah. Because if you have to say preempt somebody from accessing something, this is the easiest way to just deny. Mm. Yeah. So instead of uh, returning a 302, you change the status code and return a, a 402. <laughs> yeah. So things like my, that are a lot of fun. One of my favorites is uh, actually the exact opposite of that, which is the round tripper interface mm -hmm. in the HTTP standard library. So I love it. Do you know? You're looking at me like, I, what is yeah, that? Yeah, I've used it. And I yeah, can't um, I, it's one of my favorites. <laughs> now, if you read the documentation, um, it goes on a client, right? So HTTP client has a default round tripper, which is HTTP based requests. The documentation will say if you want to change how the transport mechanism works, maybe you want to use file as a transport system. So, you know, Unix, uh, you know, socket files, for example, right? So you could write your own implementation that does that. Maybe you want to use a database as a transport mechanism or whatever it is, right? Um, you can do that. You can kind of plug this in and it takes a request and spits out a response and error on the other side, right? So you can control the flow. But I actually, according to the documentation says you're not supposed to modify the request. You're never supposed to use it for this. I actually love it for that. <laughs> um, so one of the things I like to do, I do it with a couple things is I will uh, create my own uh, round trippers to do, say, add a JWT token to all my outgoing requests, mm -hmm. right? So I provide one client that everybody uses, right? And inside of that, it'll automatically tag with JWT, right? Uh, or stuff like that. I also use it in tests. It's a really fun way of capturing and um, replaying back third party APIs. 
right? So in your test, like you're doing an HTTP.get, you can change the transport mechanism. So instead of going to Twitter or Facebook, whatever you're trying to hit, you can just return back your own stuff. So it's incredibly useful for testing and kind of mocking out the other side of the HTTP get, right? Because it's easy to mock out your own server, right? But sometimes it's just easier to capture a payload from Twitter, store it on disk, and just replay it using a transport. That's really right? cool. So it's like the other side of the reverse yeah, proxy yeah, coin. Yeah. It's the outgoing part. Yeah. yeah. That's one of my favorite little bits. Yeah. We used reverse proxies for um, a very specific use case at the previous company. And that was for, we had a legacy application. And we kind of wanted to use the strangler pattern. So you sort of slowly carve out. So you like strangle your old legacy app by slowly carving out bits of it and putting it on the new stack until eventually the old thing can just die because nothing's using it anymore. And so we had this problem of uh, we had a website and we wanted some of the parts of the website to be served by new services and, and most of it still go to still go to the legacy servers. And so we had to put something in between and we used a, a little go re essentially reverse proxy. And I remember like my manager coming to me saying, can you write a reverse proxy in Go that will help us do this? And I was like, oh my god. <laughs> and then I discovered it's one line. You just <laughs> called a single reverse proxy, job done. Yeah, and like, then yeah the I'll give it my best shot. It might take me a couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what I did. That, that was my holidays. Uh, I'm going to go work on it at home. I'll see you in a few weeks. Come back with a tan. Yeah, I was genu <laughs> genuinely scared. I was like, oh my god, I don't know. And then it's one line. So it's really nice. And it gives you a way to basically uh, get a, receive a request and then decide, OK, if this request, request comes with this domain or based on whatever params you want, you just direct it to one service. Otherwise, you direct it to the legacy app. And that was really nice. And it was really easy. And it was actually it was really nice to have that routing logic in a separate Go app. So, yeah, and you get to use yeah. Go code to do, make these decisions. To do it, yeah. yeah. Really. Mm. One of yeah. the things I've played with, uh, and I never actually got a chance to finish it. So with, with Buffalo, for example, we watch your Go files. And as your Go files change, we rebuild it. Uh, and if there's an error, we display that error back to you from the building. But we do that with kind of like just faking it out a little bit, using a file and serving it. And it's not particularly good. And one of the things I played with is a reverse proxy, where um, you know, you actually, when you go to port 3000, it goes to this kind of dev dashboard thing and proxies it through to your application, which is now running on a different port. And if that crashes or whatever, we could just proxy that error back to you. Well, I just need more free time. Um, but it's a wonderful, wonderful tool if you've never used it. This episode is brought to you by X-Team. X-Team is the world's most energizing community for developers. In this segment, I talk with Ryan Chartrand, X-Team CEO, about living your life like a great adventure. Is your life an adventure? When is the last time you had an adventure? What if you could be part of a community that was all about living your life, working, coding, and still be adventuring at the same time? This is what Ryan has to say. We all want to go on adventures, but usually what that looks like is we have to save up a lot of money. We have to save up a lot of money. We have to save up our PTO. We have to, you know, and then eventually the adventure comes and it's very short lived as opposed to, well, what if we could do this? What if we had opportunities to do this and, and be able to code and work and still be adventuring at the same time, or at least have more opportunities to adventure. You don't have to do it all the time necessarily. And, and that's really what companies like X-Team are being able to offer today. All sorts of remote companies are offering this now. I think what X-Team is doing differently on top of that is adding this extra community layer that energizes you in, in fascinating ways because you're part of something that you truly feel like you belong in. And you're a part of something that is inspired from 25 years worth of learning from you know communities like World of Warcraft that have mastered how to bring people together and and, and keep them engaged and energized. And so when you combine that, that ability to be able to live your life like a great adventure, combined with being a part of this incredibly energizing community, you are truly getting to be a part of something special. All right, if you're ready to live your life like a great adventure, give my friends at X-Team a shout. Head to xteam.com. Once again, xteam.com. So speaking of time, Matt, yeah. it's 7.50. I thought you were going to talk about the time package. <laughs> Why? <laughs> time is on my work. side, mate. I don't need to worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> no? OK, fine. Well, <laughs> we can cut that out later. Yeah, don't, don't worry too much about the time. At some point, things will end. 
and then well, I, I'd fun. love to give these lovely people a shot at asking some of our fine panelists some questions. Maybe Great. win that gopher and that used beach towel of yours. Great idea. Soiled. 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 So, well, well, hang on a sec. Oh, Paul Jolly, where are you, sir? We're going to have to... Oh, and he was our mic gopher. He's what? He's at the dinner. He left. <laughs> He's like, I'll Dom's volunteer to walk around with the mic. Thank you, Paul. And <laughs> he went to dinner. Did he take the mic so. to dinner? He or? did. <laughs> yeah. Took yeah, just that chewing you here in the background is Paul. Yeah, let's just turn it on and see what he's having. Yeah. Hello, we're going live over to Paul. <laughs> I assume they're live streaming it. Can't they just send us some questions from dinner? Okay, yeah, so we got, uh, Dom's going to walk around. We got a question right over here down front. Uh, very first hand over here, Dom. <laughs> see my finger? I'm point over here. Dom. <laughs> oh, okay, uh, sorry. Magic. Well, I'm looking this way. You got that lovely yellow shirt. How am I supposed <laughs> to see it really bright? <laughs> My mer yeah. Have you ever used the LEN operator on a buffered channel and why? The LEN? Yes. The on a LEN? That came up today, I think, in Corey's. Mean the uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, because I don't use buffered channels. That's for buffered channels, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Because you can also set the capacity. Well, you can read the capacity and you can read the LEN. So the capacity, yeah. if you have a buffer channel of 10, the capacity would be 10, so, and the LEN would be 4, maybe. This thing, that's how many you're Yeah, in but there. you but, want to be right. careful using it, because uh, yeah. you'll probably get an inconsistent result. Yeah, it's not, it's not safe. safe. No. And yeah. you shouldn't be using buffer channels, so <laughs> it's not a problem. <laughs> one, use case, <laughs> one use case for buffer channels that I find to be great is when you want to control how many active go routines are running. So yeah. if you wanted to limit them, what you can do is create a buffered channel, and then at the start of when your go routine is going to do some work, or before that, it puts something in the channel. So say you've got five slots in this channel, the first five of those will be fine, and they'll unblock, because they'll be able to, there'll be space in this buffer. The sixth one is going to block, because this channel is full, and then it's going to wait until, and then what you do at the end when you've finished processing, you read from the channel to release that thing in the semaphore, and that then leaves a space for the next one to go in. And that's a way you can throttle, without much otherwise complexity in the code, you can throttle how many concurrent things are going to run, and the code stays relatively easy to read. It's really I got cool. asked about worker pools just the other week, and that was exactly Ah, see, I, do it the, I kind of do it the opposite way, where, let's say, you know, I, I have a channel of stuff, I want maybe five Go routines. That's my limit. And they're just ranging over the channel, so whichever one picks it up first mm. does it, and then I don't have to use buffer channels. I, mean, right. I, I do also strongly believe that you should, you should know the number of Go routines that are going to be spawned, and if it's going to be dynamically increasing, it can actually create more problems everywhere. So uh, I won't still recommend using length, LEN on a buffer channel at any time because it's risky, but uh, the pooling of Go routines or throttling them or you know, uh, limiting them uh, over this, I think we could debate on that one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we should. Well, I know it works. It it works. The thing. I, don't, it works. I don't just kick off loads of Go routines. The kicking off of a go routine is what's blocked by that channel. Right. So yeah. I do know Fair how enough. many go routines right. are running. Exactly. Well, that's cool. Yeah, that's cool. It's about readability. It's easier to read. But no, Fair we'll enough. go in yeah, the yeah. car park after and take our shirts oh, no. off and have a full fight. <laughs> no props. <laughs> There's a knife fight the, going to happen over this. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Oh, no. the, Brilliant. The, the person with lesser hair wins. <laughs> okay, Dom's got a question <laughs> over there then. As in, can I ask like an, a non technical question? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I guess my question would be, because I'm kind of like um, new to like, uh, well, tech, uh, what would be like, um, if your life was like a storybook and like um, each chapter is like a year, um, what would be like a name of like um, an influential chapter? Like for, for example, an answer for me would be like um, chapter 22, like it's go time because that's when I started learning go. And so, yeah, it's more of like and a general And 22 question. is your age, and that's the chapter. Well, it was my last age. Yeah, so every like... chapter is a year. <laughs> yes. So every that's a chapter long in chapter. my book is 21. I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're asking us what we'd call the like, current year of our lives? Well, I mean, you can go for current year of your life, but like, more like an influential year in terms of well, well, anything, really, like a current year, a year that might be influential to you in terms of like, your growth as a technical person. Just, some just of, some like of a... us have been at this for 20. Well, I mean, you can do something like <laughs> chapter like. It's going to take a while. 
Well, you just pick one year, like, you know, chapter 22, yeah. that's when you're pick one 22. Uh, for me, it would probably be the very first year I professionally started programming, um, which would unfortunately be 20 years ago. Uh, I'm dating myself, but 20 years uh, this year. You're um, dating yourself. Is that, app? <laughs> is that like a new app? It's for people who can't find love. Well, personally, I think I'm, I'm quite fanciable. So yeah, I, you know, I take myself out to the movies and oh. dinner. We, I treat myself right. Yeah, but uh, why is it not going very well? That's the thing. <laughs> it's really not. I've broken up with myself several times, uh, especially the past few years. Uh, but for me, it was actually my very first year of programming. Um, because I, you know, if you don't know my background, I actually have a degree in music. Um, and so obviously not computer science. So when I got my first job, it was the dot-com boom of the 90s. Um, and if you could spell HTML, you got a job. Uh, and if you knew what it meant, it was like another 5K and Y2K. years. Wonderful. And, y <laughs> and Y2K. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's so like 1999. And I happened to find this job in Boston where uh, the developers on the team were just spectacular. And they were more than happy to sit with me and, and teach me and show me how to write code and how to write good code and, and how to read code and how to understand code. And so to me, the lessons I learned in that very first year of programming have stuck with me to this day. And it's one of the reasons I quite enjoy mentoring because it was such a big part of my learning process. Because in 1999, we didn't have a ton of books on programming. We didn't have certainly didn't have tons of online resources and videos and conferences and all this sort of stuff online, so you could only learn from other people. Mm. Uh, and that to me was the most valuable thing of that year, was learning from these professionals and these people who knew what they were doing and taught me some wonderful things. That's lovely. Do you stay in touch with them? I absolutely do, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, just, I have some very good friends that we still see each other. I was just at one of my friend's house about a month ago uh, having dinner. Yeah, so I still see these people 20 years later. They were at my wedding, I was at their wedding. Uh, just lovely people. Yeah, we still stay in touch. Thanks yeah. to Ben for that really complicated question. <laughs> Does anyone want to ask a more complicated question? Because th that was too easy to try and we go think of a, back? your life as a novel. Yeah. It's I didn't give it a name, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I have a name for it. Don't worry, we'll do the names later. The Fair Marksman. Oh. Oh. Oh, sorry. That's one okay. of those things we can cut out for Gotham now. <laughs> you get one cut each. You get one cut <laughs> each. You don't have to embarrass yourself once. Matt, you've used like 10. <laughs> okay, oh, so, so you're yes. ready for a question. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure because one, one of you uh, is really biased in it, but when is the point where you start using a, a web framework? What would I'll, you say? I'll, I'll stay away <laughs> from yes, the I, question. Yeah. I, I do have a valid answer. Well, I think it's a valid answer, but I'm going to stay away from it. Mark's basically like the Clippy version for Buffalo. If he's like, oh, it looks like you're trying to write a web app. He pops up, <laughs> he pops up on the screen somehow in the corner. I, so my real quick, but I'd love to hear um, others take, obviously, because, I, yeah, I am slightly biased. Um, but I'm biased in that... Um, coming from something like Rails, what I loved about Rails was the productivity gains, right? Like, go, like, I can very quickly write a very small app, but when I start writing a large app, the structure, the kind of complexity that comes along with large apps and, you know, templating and sessions and cookies and databases and all that sort of stuff, you know, there's just so much kind of boilerplate you have to write. Uh, and that's where I turned to, you know, I used to turn to Rails, you know, and now I turn to to Buffalo, right, because it's the Go version, and I can just get up and running and I can start writing my business logic. That's when I turn to it. I don't always use Buffalo, though. That is, the feel, that is actually true. I don't always use it, because it's not always the right solution for what I'm looking for. But I'm curious to see Yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty way. sure I, I like the question, because uh, you need to use the right tools for the right job. So if you actually want to build a web application, you might want to rethink about using Go in general. You want to use a web no. application? No, no that's the wrong answer. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I'll, I'll cover. So if you want to just build some standard <laughs> API work that Please. you want to do, just use Rails. But I'll give you an example, <laughs> and Mark, you'll actually like this, but we needed to put out a very lightweight web server on a Raspberry Pi, and I didn't want to install anything on it. That's the time I actually used Buffalo, and I bundled up the entire, in one binary and just mm. put it on a Pi. So there are use cases where you want to use a Buffalo exactly because there is no dependency for installation. But if you want to build a larger web application, just use the right tools. And sometimes, uh, I mean, I found uh, using Rails for the front interfacing for API, API versioning, whichever way you want to look at it and scaling it up, but do all the heavy lifting maybe using Go. So 
use multiple languages, be polyglot, uh, be available so that the right tool is being used for the job. And personally, if you're writing a web application in Go starting from scratch, as long as it's a simple small application, you're okay. But as the complexity increases with the, the da databases coming in and your uh, uh, rate limiting and versioning and middleware, it just starts getting a lot of lines of code and people have already done it. So if people have already been there, done that, don't go reinventing the wheel just because you want to use Go. Well, Frank, the solutions you. that are already built in Go. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I tend to agree with, uh, I think if you're new to programming, I think that looking at a massive framework can scare you off and you kind of look at it and go like, I don't know what anything is. So I think with the framework, you kind of have to know already what a framework, what MVC, what all of that is. Uh, so I think if you're just trying to learn programming, I think it's better to start with um, just sort of like a native little app with no bells and whistles, no framework, so that you can really understand the concept, concepts under the hood. Uh, and then if, you're, if you've already done it once in another language or something, then yeah, by all means, don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, another way to go for me is um, something that we do at Monzo is we don't use frameworks because we have microservices, but we use a combination of libraries and code generation. So we basically bundled all the common logic in libraries that every little microservice inherits, and they're all code generated. So if you want a new service, you just code generate a service template. They're all homogeneous. They all inherit the same libraries for authentication and logging and requests and all of that. So that's another way to go if you don't want to use uh, like an MVC style framework. How but do you describe <laughs> the services at Monzo? Microservices. What do you mean? I mean, how do you describe them? Blue, how do you define little. Them? They, they are, they no. are single, no. single no. responsibility. Sorry, when yeah. you say like something gets generated, yeah. what, get, what, what does it get generated and what does it get generated from? So it, genera it gets generated from templates. So we, we have an internal tool called service gen. And we just call that, say, like, give it this name of the service, and oh, it just generates the empty. Creates like an empty service. Yeah. I see. Okay. So basically, just like a. So the you just need to, so, Yes. So you just so have to put in your domain logic. So you just need to fill in your handlers, yeah. your proto, proto definitions, right. all of that. So stuff. I think the answer is it depends. Yes. Yeah. So I guess that would be fulfilling the same kind of function that a yeah. framework might give you. Yeah. You have a homegrown. Framework. I think like it's basically yeah. to sum up like it's worth doing it once from scratch so we understand it because nothing will teach you better than like rewriting a sim like writing a simple complex context package or writing a debugger from scratch or something yeah. like this so, because that but really that's, teaches that's a you. like I'm trying to learn perspective. Like yeah. so right. for me like you know as a consultant as somebody who builds a lot of apps like for me time is of the essence. Just getting yeah. to market, getting the thing out, right? So that's when you, I would absolutely turn to a Buffalo or previously Rails where it's just like, boom, I can start business logic, somebody else has made all the decisions for me, and I'm good, right? But just like in, in Ruby, uh, I would use Sinatra for some really small things where I didn't need a full-blown Rails app, right? And in Go, I still turn to the standard library when I just need a small, Simple quick, app, yeah. tight little web app, yeah. and I don't need the bells and whistles you know, see, that comes along with it. that's true, particularly if you're starting from something that you, you don't really know where it's going. If you go straight to a framework, you're going to be locked into the opinions of that framework. Yeah. And if you know that the opinions of that framework meet what you're going to be doing, then great, it is the right tool for the job. And if you haven't figured that out yet, then maybe it's too early to adopt a framework. Yeah. That's actually yeah, a really good point, because a framework is something else to learn. Mm. Yep. However simple it is, it is a new yeah. thing to learn. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, it, it, in, in the beginning of projects, you don't really know ever what you're going to be doing, I think. Yeah, and if you lock yourself into a framework, it's almost, it's very hard to get yourself out of the framework. Yes. Like after a few years of development, you're not going to, it's going to be very hard to leave that framework. But if you are, don't have a framework, it's a lot easier to migrate into a framework, I find. Yes. Well, I always say build small things. And, that, and I, don't, I don't mean like, therefore, don't have big companies and stuff. But, <laughs> but actually, if you can avoid it, don't have big companies. It's way easier. <laughs> when it really is. More. Yeah. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's try to get another question. I, yeah. think, <laughs> I think we beat web frameworks to death. Ben's winning so far because uh, he asked us to So, do that Dom, who's our next question? We've got one over the back over there, and then I'll come back to the front. And then we've got OK. This is for the prize. Is this, one, is this the yeah. last question? Oh, there we go. Hello. Um, going a bit back to context, right? It's a quite elegant solution. It's a quite good way to give timeouts and, and deadlines for functions. And I use a lot for HTTP handlers, web services. But the thing is that I usually see most of developers, they never get the context and check if it's canceled, if it's done, or whatever, right? So they always delegate a third part library 
to do this decision. And, and if the library returns an error, returns an error, why? You bubble it up, you deal with that, and you know that the cancel was cancelled. So what do you guys think and how much do you guys look to the context to cancel your code itself? You know? So I think first of all, so for anyone that didn't uh, hear that, it was talking about the, uh, a lot of the times you can see context just pass through. The, mo the methods themselves that you're writing don't deal with it. I think that's totally legitimate. If you're calling some other service and it's cancelable and you're allowing that to be cancelled somewhere else upstream, sometimes it's completely appropriate to just pass that straight through and don't touch it. But whenever I'm doing any kind of heavy lifting, looping around, I will at the top just check. And you can also check the error on a context. Yep, that's one of the four. One of the four methods is, is an error. error. And it returns either nil if everything's OK or a context cancelled error. So sometimes you don't have to even use the channel. You can just check that error. And if, that's, if there's an error, you know the, can, the context has been cancelled. I think you just return the error well, from your Yeah, fetch. well, it doesn't, I mean, so by default in the standard library, though, they're context deadline errors. However, if you implement your own context interface, that error can be anything you want, mm. <laughs> right? You can cancel the context with done, and the error could be the database doesn't exist, right? right? It's not necessarily a cancellation error, is it? It's, you can still cancel and give a better error, uh, which is very good for Go routines because it's hard to propagate errors up a lot in Go routines, isn't it? Yeah. Um, unless you use like mm. error group or something. Right. Yeah, so I think it's okay to just, if you're not sure, but you know that it's, you're going to be doing something as part of an HTTP thing, then you could use that context and just pass it through. The request comes with a context. And that does get cancelled if, the, if they do the back button or they refresh or they close the browser or whatever. Modern browsers will cancel that context. So that is quite cool if you're doing some heavy lifting and doing some work and yeah. you actually can abort early and not do any work. It's quite satisfying. Yeah. Yeah. It's also clean up, and clean up all that stuff that maybe got opened that's yeah. no longer useful anymore. Yeah. Right. I'd say it's just a, a, a safer habit to have as well, because if you think of the alternative, which is not pass it down, then you, ha you can have something further like downstream that expects that context and assumes that it's the one passed from the top. And then mm -hmm. something in the middle, if it starts a new context, and suddenly you, you, lose of it, you lose that and it's a mess. So I think even if you're not planning to use it, it's just always safer to pass it down because it saves you refactoring later. And it always ensures that it trickles down rather than somebody randomly overriding it with context background because right. they yep, haven't yep. had it passed. So. Yeah. yeah, and it's yeah. a completely new yeah. context yeah. almost. Like you can just keep wrapping. Remember, we were saying about the nodes, so you can even wrap smaller, tighter cancellations on yeah. bits of it. Yeah, <laughs> like passing it down won't hurt you, but not passing it can hurt you. Yes. Yeah. So don't not pass it. <laughs> so great question. I think we had one more question. Is that right, Dom? We've got two more. One two more questions. Okay. okay. We still have the plush gopher to give away. So yeah. none of your questions have been good enough, apparently. I think Ben's. I mean, which one was Ben? Serialize your life. <laughs> that was a book. Yeah, that actually was quite yeah. good. Was yeah. Cool. yeah, it's complicated. To be honest, it's more complex than regex. That question. <laughs> <laughs> well, just parsing the question. Yeah, it was a good one. Uh, okay, yeah. so we got I two more. So the... first one, I don't know where what the mic about is. The captures. <laughs> Speak. Hello. There Hello. You go. Uh, so this question is a lot less technical uh, than the others. Um, but I read an article earlier and it basically said that the next top five sites for fintech locations would be London, Singapore, Belfast, New York and Dublin. Um, as a local guy my, myself in, in Ireland, I thought it was flattering that, that Belfast and Dublin got the mention, but I'm, I'm skeptical about who done that research and whether they were from Ireland themselves. What I wanted to ask is, uh, considering Brexit and the implications that, that be, could be coming up, luckily for, for all of us here, London is number one. But if you were not able to, to be present in, in London and program here, wh whereabouts in the world would you go to be a Go developer? I enjoy Boston, but that's also where I live. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know. Personally, I think that you can do the job anywhere. It really doesn't would, matter. Live where you want to live. I was yeah. going to say, I would encourage remote, looking into remote work if that's your thing. Like, it's not for everyone. Some people like going to the office, and that's completely fine. But if you're not particularly attached to the office, <laughs> If you, you then have the whole world of companies that you could work for. So especially if you're, if you're in a place which doesn't really have many native local companies and you want to work for amazing company X, if they hire remotely, that's your chance. So, yeah, in fact, talk, yeah. to, talk yeah. to GitLab. GitLab doesn't have an office. I was just talking to somebody earlier, and that's so cool. So they have so many people 
all over the world, but they don't have a single office location. I don't think uh, geography matters anymore. Yeah. I think so too. My team is remote, and uh, most of the company at Aqua is based either in Israel or Boston, so I know I'd have like a home to go to. And if yet I you wanted never to go come to, to Boston and visit me. I do, I just don't see you. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I'm there every two weeks, Mark. Thank you, Liz. Can't, yeah, thank you. <laughs> classic burn. Good it really was a classic. <laughs> really was. It was good. I make an effort to see you every time I'm in London. That's very kind. Thank you. Yeah, that's also a lie, but that's beside the point. Uh, yeah, so remote. And we had one more. One more. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah oh, there we go. Uh, I'd like to ask you, you guys, about the singleton pattern. I know it's a very controversial design pattern, and with Go you can sort of implement it using package level variables. And I've seen it being used uh, mainly when it comes to configuration, uh, for example, using the Viper package. And I'd like to hear your thoughts on the singleton pattern, uh, whether it should be used, whether it should not be used. Yeah. Well, that's a great question. Um, and for me, it's, it's don't use it. It's as simple as that. And actually, don't use any global state. In fact, maybe even in the next version of Go, we get rid of package space, global state altogether. If it's a config, you can just pass a config in. You don't have to be, it doesn't have to be a singleton, you know? And it's, it's clearer, I think. It means that the dependency is, is clear that, that it's needed. It's not just any, because if it's a global space, anything in that package can access it. So you don't know, you don't really know the flow of where that thing's being accessed. You'd have to go and find it. Versus if it's passed in, it's, it's a bit more verbose, but it's infinitely clearer. So I probably wouldn't use the singleton. Package. Yeah, I think it does complicate, it does complicate things a lot. So you avoid, avoid using it, but if it's being used in a package, so be it. But don't try to get around a singleton pattern or try to, try to break it. <laughs> just, just let it be it, there. It makes testing harder as well. It does. Yeah, yeah, it often, absolutely makes testing harder. Yes, yeah, so. often in tests you want to try it with different config in that case or different state. And you want to also be able to run your tests maybe in parallel or concurrently uh, and in different orders and stuff. And if you've got this state that's sticking around between them, it's kind of uh, awkward. And can create interesting and strange, weird bugs that take a while. If you avoid global state, Peter Bergen said it very well. He said, if I, if I had to give five pieces, five words to a new Go programmer, they would be, don't use global state. He, did, he didn't even use the last word. That's how, confident, <laughs> that's how confident he is that that's right. I think it was do not, actually. No, it wasn't. <laughs> He'd use the contraction. <laughs> and, that, and that's Peter. That and that's just Peter. terrible English as well, right? It's just, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, the only thing I would say to that is the asterisk of unless you need it. <laughs> well, well, yeah, and, well and no, I mean, like, it's, it, like, that is 100% solid advice. Like, try said, to you, avoid it. You, but like everything in life, like, sometimes there might be a reason. Um, like, everything has a, a use case. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a pattern. There were some bad patterns. Oh, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. And, yeah. and I, I'm with people. I'm not I, arguing that yeah. you should. I, I, I do until you need it. Lots and lots of you know <laughs> live code things where I use global variables because it's convenient for doing things very quickly on the fly. It's yeah. terrible for like maintainable yeah. code. Oh it's yeah. <laughs> global state smells very bad to me. Yeah, it can be. The solution to it can be as simple as just having a struct and putting them all in there. Even just doing that really does yeah. help. Um, I don't know that, I, I honestly don't think there's a case where you have to use global state. I didn't say there was, I just said you might. <laughs> it's like, don't, yeah, don't do it until you have to do it. Until you have to, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, if someone's got well, a gun to Well, but you can use head. a singleton pattern inside of a struct, for example. Okay. Right, like I'm not saying, like we're talking global state, um, and we're just assuming that we're doing it at a global level. Well, I think Doesn't mean you can't use a singleton pattern inside of code for other reasons. It wouldn't be a singleton pattern then, would it? Sure it would. You wouldn't just have one of them. If no, you but uh, you might absolutely do it. If you're compiling, uh, say, a, a, you know, you've got a bunch of data in your struct and you need to formulate it in something that's big and expensive and it's only an operation that's ever gonna do once, you'd have a sync dot once in your, 
struct, you do it, you just return the cached value at that point. From, but it's all still with contained. It's not global state anymore. Mm. So that's why I'm saying like the pattern itself is not bad. It's how we use the pattern that makes it bad. Global state makes the pattern bad. The pattern itself doesn't make the pattern bad. Right. Mm. Fair, right. Like fair you can still use it, but try not to do it globally. Right. There are reasons I, I use sync dot once a lot inside of stuff, and that is a singleton pattern. Sync dot once enables singletons. So otherwise we'd never have sync dot once, right? Yeah, well no, I use sync once in places where it's not then a singleton, but um, yeah, I see. But what it, you mean. it enables the singleton pattern very well. I guess it does. Yeah. So anyway, so to avoid global state, I think we all agree on that. Yes. Um, but as a pattern, you know, there are times you might want to use it. You might also use factory patterns a lot, you know, an occasion. We don't use them in Go a lot, but Java loves them. Yeah. They just, they have factories for factories over yeah. there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's amazing <laughs> what they do. It Impl. must be massive. It's like a factory, factory service Impl. Yeah. Yeah, you need that. <laughs> uh, I think that's all we've got time for then. I think so. Uh, we need to choose a winner of the plush Go for, for the best question. I mean, there's a standout winner for me, but. How do we want Was to it one of mine? This? No, obviously oh, okay. not. <laughs> yeah. uh, I like the uh, what would a year, chapter, yeah. year in your yeah. life be? Yeah, ben. I think, do we all agree? That was a good question, wasn't it? Yeah? yeah. Okay. No, clearly <laughs> not everybody agrees. But yeah, there you go. <laughs> Gotham, let's, sh let's show them that, uh, that arm here that the Yankees are trying to recruit you for. Throw that over there to Could them. you throw that over to <laughs> Come on. Show oh, us that oh, arm. Man. Come on, really wind it up. There you go. If Tom Brady ever runs out of the Patriots, we gotta recruit you. I just missed, by the way. You missed. Oh, <laughs> missed. then never mind. We're not gonna recruit you. Yeah. No, we were doing. You can go to the podcast. Yankees. We're completely different sports teams. Don't by forget, the way. it's a podcast. Uh, oh yeah. You got we, it. We got we'll it. CGI it, it in, in and yeah. we'll go right to the right place. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they don't well, know. They can't see. I think. Yeah, I think we have uh, now run out of time, haven't we? So what a I'm great no experience this was. I mean, this is. Don't forget, this is not just a podcast. This is also an actual live event in real life, which is this. It's also uh, being live streamed. It's going to be a video. It's going to be a book. We're going to try to get it on Netflix. It's going to be can, the can IMAX. Can you imagine? You might have to watch this over and over again. I mean, yeah. Yeah. what do you have so, to do By the way, life? if you do a live podcast like this, when Matt and I were planning it, we may have forgotten to tell the panelists uh, that there was going to be an audience. Uh, and it was going to be on YouTube. <laughs> so you can only imagine their lovely face when we show, oh yeah, it's going to be vil filmed and live, and Gotham's like, what? <laughs> In a way, well, it's I knew. The way I, I look knew. at it is I think among all the panelists, the people who spoke the most were you both. <laughs> <laughs> so enjoy it. Yeah, that's about right, I think, yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's obvious we shouldn't be organizing anything. I mean, yeah. that to me is already obvious it's not... It's to the point where it's so obvious, it stops being our fault. That's how I think of it. <laughs> uh, so I do actually have one question about this. Um, did people enjoy it? Should we do this again next year? Yeah, yeah. yeah nice. <laughs> OK. Yeah, OK. I like it. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, uh, we should do a proper closing of the show, because podcasts, they at some point have to end. You just want more, more applause. Just, no, 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 I don't want that. <laughs> so the thing is, that. Matt and I don't want to get off stage because we're not on stage for the rest of the week, uh, except for when we're on stage hosting the conference for the rest of the week. So we really like to. Uh, yeah, no, soak I'm it just up. trying to be professional, and you keep interrupting me and stop me from being professional. Yeah, well, Kat, why don't you just close us out? <laughs> oh, thank you, everyone, for coming. We hope you enjoy this, and see most of you tomorrow. Thank you so nice. much. Thank you. Yay! All right, thank you for tuning into this week's episode of Go Time. If you're not yet, hang with us in Go for Slack. We have a channel called Go Time FM. Look it up, you'll find us. Hang with us during the live shows, connect with other members of the community, share stories, share code, share coffee recipes, whatever. It's a lot of fun. 
Also, we have discussions at changelaw.com on every episode. Head to changelaw.com slash go time, find this episode and discuss it with the community. Also, thanks to Fast, the our bandwidth partner, Rollbar for helping us move fast and fix things, and Linode for hosting the Change Law platform. Our music is produced by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. And if you want to hear more awesome podcasts like this, subscribe to our master feed. It's one feed to rule them all, plus some extras that only hit the master feed. Head to changelaw.com slash master or search for changelawmaster in your podcast client. You'll find us. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week.